briefcase contained some papers that are going to make some young men mighty happy. The man who carried it was personnel representative of one of the largest corporations in America. He came here to the college to interview some young men who will graduate in engineering this June. He'll take those records and his impressions of some of the men he has met back with him. With other members of the personnel department, he will review each case carefully. When they finish, they will offer some men an all-expenses trip to the plant, by air, to look it over firsthand before signing up. That's backside front, isn't it? A job looking for a man. These engineering jobs are important ones. Jobs worth doing. Jobs that will give a lot of satisfaction when they're well done. These jobs are looking for young men with ability. The demand is greater than the supply, and it looks as if it will be for at least another 10 years. The danger in this situation is that many high school graduates, their eyes filled with the glamour of the professional engineer and the size of his paycheck, may plunge into professional engineering training without the proper background without the aptitude, without the genuine interest, without the will to put in the necessary work. That this is a real danger is shown by the fact that at one college, of 10 boys who start an engineering course, four drop out by the end of the first year. It's pretty much the same story at other colleges. Well, perhaps their time and their money is not all wasted but it could have been spent more wisely. A second and more important danger in this shortage of engineers is that many young men who are qualified and suited to the field will get away. Because they are not aware of their aptitudes and abilities, or because they have an inaccurate idea of what an engineer does, or simply because they never thought of it. This is a real danger too because our best insurance against war is our national strength. National strength in this mechanized era depends on industrial strength. And that depends on having a supply of the trained people who translate ideas into machinery, structures, and products. On engineers. So we'd like to have you think about engineering. We hope to show you that engineering is a whale of a broad profession and has in it room for more widely differing people than you may realize. We hope to show you that there are scientific ways to discover whether you have the abilities to succeed in engineering, whether your interests lie in the fields of engineering, and whether you have the necessary grit to make the grade. If you find that you are qualified and interested, it will be up to you to prepare yourself in high school to enter an engineering college with a running start. Let's begin with the scientific testing program we mentioned. Even if your school is in a position to provide every pupil testing and counseling, it will still be worth your time and the modest cost to make use of the testing facilities of some college or university. Your own state college, university, teacher's college, and many private schools have fine testing facilities. Take a tip from Bill, who decided that if he was determined to enter a technical field, he ought to have technical advice as to whether it was a wise move. He had already taken the battery of tests at the college and had come back for what he considered as near a verdict as he ever wanted to face. He could see the counselor was prepared for him, and you could hardly blame him for being nervous. Hi, Bill. Mr. Collins. Hi, how are you? Do I get to take engineering? Well, we're not here to tell you whether you can take engineering or not, but we have some test results there that'll help you make up your own mind. Okay. Why don't you pull up a chair here, Bill, and we'll plot this on the board, and you'll get an idea of what it looks like. Well, first of all, your general intelligence, and with that, your high school record. Now, you see, these are both well above average and roughly equal. That's good. You mean it's good because they're equal? Suppose your high school record had only come to about this point. Now, that would mean that although your ability was good, 
You hadn't used your ability to its best advantage in high school. If a guy's lazy in high school, he's probably going to be lazy in college. And that kind of guy will not get through engineering. He'll either drop out himself, or he'll be asked to drop. But those two tests mean I can get through college okay, huh? Well, I think you can do better than just get through, Bill. Let's take a look at your aptitude tests. Those were the tests I worked? Yes, that's right. I didn't get through them all. Well, actually, we wouldn't expect you to finish them all. If you did, and if everyone finished them, we'd have no basis of comparison. Now, your verbal aptitude was only about average. Your computational aptitude is well above average. Now, on space relations... Wasn't that the one that looked like a lot of blueprints? Yes, that's right. That was the test where they showed you a box taken apart in sections, and you had to determine what the box would look like put together again. Space relations, quite high. Mechanical aptitude, very good. But that means I ought to take engineering, doesn't it? Oh, not so fast, Bill. We ought to get a look at your interest pattern first. But I know what I'm interested in. I'm interested in mechanics, and I'm good in mechanics, too. Wait a minute, Bill. That's not all it takes. Just because a guy likes to monkey with the motor in his car doesn't mean he's an engineer. Maybe it means he's an auto mechanic. The aptitudes and interests that you just mentioned are more typically associated with success in mechanical trades than success with in engineering. Frequently, the guy who takes engineering because he likes to tinker around with automobiles would have been wiser to become an auto mechanic. We think it would be better for him to succeed as a mechanic than to fail as an engineer. Well, what does it take to be an engineer? Well, Bill, we've found that the best engineers have aptitudes in math and in mechanics, as well as sound interests in mechanics, math, and in science. More and more, engineering is becoming a scientific field rather than just strictly a mechanical field. And the best engineers are also strong in literary and verbal abilities. Well, let's see the rest of the results. Okay, Bill, we'll put the rest of them on the board. A mechanical interest, high. Computational interest, high also. Scientific interest, very high. Literary interest, low. Artistic interest, surprisingly high. But it does mean I could be a good engineer, doesn't it? <laughs> You're really determined to be an engineer, aren't you, Bill? Well, the pattern looks pretty good. You look pretty much like an engineer. There's one thing, Bill, that you're going to have to watch, though. Your ability in the communication arts is better than is your interest. You're going to have to pay real close attention and work hard in those courses that teach you to speak directly and write clearly. Well, why is that? Because you have to write reports as an engineer. And when you write reports, you have to make them clear. Because just as a newspaper man is writing something for someone to read and understand, you as an engineer have to do that. The easier you make it for them to understand, the better impression you'll make as an engineer. Let's look into these a little more thoroughly. Of course, not all good engineering profiles are exactly like Bill's. But with those profiles and the tests back of them, testing services are able to give you a lot of reliable help in picking the right vocation. So take advantage of that help. But aptitude, interest, and ambition aren't enough. Unless you're a glutton for punishment, you should have a good high school preparation in order to take advantage of college engineering courses. So when your high school counselor tells you, you should be able to do good work in math and take all you can get. You should be able to do good work in chemistry and physics and take both of them if they're offered. And you must be able to do good work in English, too. When he tells you that, you believe him. Now, what about this field of engineering itself? What's it like? What does it have to offer? Perhaps you believe that with your personality, engineering is the last profession that could satisfy you. 
let's take a look at several boys as different as they can be and see what they found out about engineering here's their class it may not be just the same size as yours but our engineers come out of classrooms just like yours all over the country some girls take engineering but it's not a common thing so let's eliminate the girls then let's eliminate those with grade averages below a C those with definite interests in other fields and those with aptitudes that fit them for some other work there you have it four candidates who have the stuff to make it let's look at them individually Bob's a pretty quiet person he's known as a brain and prefers physics to football why and how do things work this is the type of problem that stimulates Bob's natural curiosity when someone mentions engineering to Bob, he imagines something like this. Get that stuff up here. Move that shovel over. Put it there. What's the matter with you riveters? Get those kids out of here. Bob doesn't think he would fit into such a situation. Bob's imagination has given him an idea that is out of date and incorrect. Because engineering does have a kind of job that will suit Bob. You see? Whether you go into mechanical, electrical, chemical, civil, or any other branch of engineering, you will find that your job falls in one of these three broad classifications. Research and development, management sales, or production. Now research is probably made to order for Bob, and it's an expanding field. These figures represent engineers employed in research and development in 1941. 17,000 in government employment, 62,000 in industry, and 8,000 in universities and colleges. In 12 years, the government almost doubled the number. Industry doubled theirs, and the universities tripled their numbers in these fields. Research was made for Bob. He would like this phase of ceramic engineering. For instance, helping to build a racetrack. Not a model, but the real thing a ceramic racetrack for electrons. It is the heart of the synchrotron which is used for nuclear research. But research and development is not limited to the purely theoretical fields. Research, followed by development, enters into building the everyday tools with which Americans make their livings. How long have we charted our way by sextant readings, depending on clear skies to find out where we are? The radio sextant is a product of research and development. It tracks the sun all day, rain or shine. Exactly how do you find out how to build a better plow? Engineers don't guess about anything they can measure. What happens to a plow when it plows? It's up to the research and development man to find out and to apply his findings towards making a better one. Modern industry can't wait for inventions to happen. Research and development is geared to find new products and methods constantly. And Bob, the brain trust, can find a job that will challenge him, one he will like, in this phase of engineering. There's nothing shy about Don. He's self-confident, personable, sociable. He's got a lot of friends. He's pretty good at public speaking. When Don thinks of engineering, he imagines something like this. A drafting room is the place where engineers' plans are processed. It's an important place. Some like it very much, and others insist that it's a very good place to start out. Don doesn't think he'd like it. Maybe not. Nevertheless, engineering offers Don other jobs that will challenge and use his social abilities and varied interests. Let's see what Don's place in engineering looks like. A good salesman must know his product and that of his competitors. He must know the whole field. That's more than ever true for the man who must supervise a sales force or work with distributors. It's not hard to see how valuable an engineering background can be in sales work. This is a side of engineering that has never occurred to Don before. For instance, how can an engineer help sell rock crushers in a highly competitive situation? What about the product, crushed rock? Can you improve it? Research shows that an angular form in the crushed rock, aggregate it's called, is better than a flat or sliver form. 
the angular aggregate is less likely to slide around under the loads placed on it. What do you do to get a higher percentage of the angular type from your crushing machines? The impact crusher is developed. You study it in slow motion pictures, some 300 times slower than normal. The hammers break rock and throw rocks together hard enough to break them. The product has a high percentage of the desired angular form, and your sales effort gets a shot in the arm. But manufacturers in a competitive field can't stand still. What are the problems of the contractor, the man who is your customer? Hauling costs him a lot of money when a big job is a long way from the plant. So the management sales force calls for a portable rock crusher that can be moved close to the job, a management decision based on engineering estimates. Work, imagination, and engineering knowledge pay off in profits, as the sales engineer points out the improvement to the cost-conscious businessmen who buy the machinery. Don has a lot of imagination. He prides himself on that. And in engineering, there are jobs that will keep him right on his toes. He would like that. In other words, there is a career in engineering that would fit Don. While Don is the extroverted type of individual, Paul, in the same class, is known as the strong, silent type. He's a big guy, an athlete, and goes along without attracting much attention until somebody wants to get something done. Then they call on Paul. Paul knows his uncle as a chemical engineer who got into research. And when Paul imagines himself as an engineer, he sees himself in a smelly place full of glassware. He'd feel out of place in this, although his uncle finds it fascinating. But there is a part of engineering that is just as good a fit for Paul as other parts were for Don and Bob. Production engineer. The man between the materials yard and the delivery yard. He's got to know how to keep quality up and costs down. One job for a production engineer might be to design huge fixtures that will hold tons of steel in place while it is welded. Or it might just as readily be providing an environment where flight simulators can be assembled. Work where the ordinary dust in the air is a hazard. If the production man is turning out thousands of identical units, he has the problem of making the flow of materials match manufacturing capacity. The flow of sub-assemblies match the assembly line. The flow of the assembly line match demands of the sales force. When items must be custom made, when everyone is different, it's the production engineer who plans the assembly system that will tell each worker what to do on each separate order so that the instruction sheets may be written out. The necessary parts gathered from the stockroom and put together, properly set and regulated to each requirement. But the production engineer works not only with materials and machines, he works with men. Did you know that newly made cellophane is porous? and must be moisture-proof before it is sold. It takes a machine three stories high to coat it, dry it, and wind it into rolls again. These men must splice a new roll of cellophane under the old one while the machine is running. First, he makes a crayon mark on the underside of the material, near the beginning of the new roll. From this mark, he cuts the cellophane away to leave a long tongue held by a piece of tape. He will glue this tongue to the end of the old roll. This sounds easy, until you know that the new roll weighs nearly half a ton. The cellophane is traveling through the machine at about 11 feet per second. And, if they goof, the machine must be re-threaded, and the eye of the needle is three stories up. How about it, Mr. Production Engineer? Do your men have the temperament, coordination, decisiveness, teamwork, training and experience to do the job. In production, the respect Paul wins so readily can really pay off. Our fourth candidate, well, let's call him X. His qualifications aren't going to be as easy to pinpoint as those of Bob or Don or Paul. He may have the aptitudes and abilities for some field of engineering, and yet seem a little lazy because he hasn't found anything to interest him. The simple situations outlined for Bob, Don, and Paul probably won't help X very much. His problem is a little more complex, 
so he will have to find more information, probably on his own. There are three things X can do to get a better idea of what engineering can offer him and what he can offer engineering. He can take additional tests to better understand some of his qualifications. In addition, he can visit teachers at any engineering college who will be happy to talk with him about his future. And third, he can obtain from them the names of engineers near his home, engineers who are ready to show him what the engineer does and what it takes to be one. Who is X? Well, he's a person who may find engineering a challenging and profitable life's work when he discovers the many job types in this very broad field and when he realizes that he will have to make an investment in good hard work. He is a person who has the intelligence and initiative to find out more about what engineering can offer him. Who is X? Maybe he's you.